Good morning. I already realized I came up too soon, so I'll, I'll take a note for next, next hour. But it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Aren't we already blessed? Aren't we already blessed acknowledging how loved we are by God and how he chooses us? And being the kids' pastor, I'm super aware that this is the start of back to school. So I thought, would you join with me in prayer as we pray for our kids that are stepping in into their school system? So if you have children, think about them. If you have grandchildren, if you know a child, think about them. So will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just come before you, and I'm reminded of the Joshua 1.9, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord is with you wherever you go. This morning, we ask that our kids remember that. We ask that our kids will remember they're not walking into the school alone, but that you are with them. God, will you give them courage to shine their light in this dark world? Lord, we know that there is no junior Holy Spirit. There is only the Spirit that resides in our kids and that have said yes to you. So Lord, we just ask that you would empower them. Will you keep them safe? Will you protect them? And will you know that they are not alone? Will you let them know they are not alone and that you're with them? We pray this in Jesus' heavenly name. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys, are you ready? Yeah. I got the call. There had been an accident in the preschool. Now, it's not the call 91 kind of accident. It's the kind that's going to require a lot of cleanup and some new clothes. And so uh, that's not unusual. This is a preschool. But what's unusual is how we discovered the accident. The child had decided to go down the slide and left a trail. And so, yeah. That was unusual. So our Miss Christina grabbed the child and the rest of the kids and ushered them into the classroom and was able to call facilities and me and let us know that there was a problem that we needed to take care of. Um, Lori and I had enough of the story to know that there was a mess on a slide. And while Christina was handling the personal side, we decided we would take care of the structural side. And I'm the type of leader that doesn't ask other people to do things that I am not willing to do, so I knew I needed to take this one for the team. So Lori and I met at the top of the indoor slide. Now, we could not see the mess from the top, and we could not see the mess from the bottom, but I've been on that slide. I'm not trying to brag, but I have been. And it is curvy, and it is fast. And we knew that we needed to get on to the business of taking care of this. So I decided, let's gather some rags. I'll put two, hand, two rags on my hands. I'll lay a rag on my front side, and she would grab my legs, and I'd enter the slide. <laughs> this way, I could wipe and whatever I didn't get, my body would get the rest. <laughs> this was a super dumb idea. <laughs> we don't know this yet. I'm spraying my rags with disinfectant. I'm heading in first. I still don't see the evidence of the mess we're going there to clean up, but I say, I'll, I'll go, I'll go deeper. So I start going there, and then I realized I'm heading first, head first into something that is not nice. <laughs> And I did not have faith that Lori was going to be able to hold on to me. And I began to panic. Pull me out! Pull me out! And now Lori is laughing so hard that she's losing all her strength. <laughs> My ankles start getting loosened from her grip. And so I throw those rags down. I get my spidey suction cup hands, and I'm pushing myself out. I finally fall out the front of it, and we are laughing so hard. Oh, my gosh. Now, the cherry on top of this... All of that planning, all of that thought, we weren't even at the right slide. <laughs> all that stress for absolutely nothing. I'm going to shout out to Lori that she's the one who took care of that slide. I was willing, but my willingness only went as far as my faith in Lori allowed me. The Bible defines faith as the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. I was assured that Lori wanted to hold me. I was not convinced she could. <laughs> so that made me lack faith. So this past summer, we've been telling the stories of Abraham, watching him listen to God and respond in faith. God became friends with one man, Abraham. And he gave Abraham a promise that he would be a great nation, many descendants. And through him, he would bless the world. And specifically, that blessing was going to come from the son Sarah and Abraham had, who was named Isaac. And that is very important for us to remember, that God named Isaac as the way that he was going to be blessing the world. So will you stand with me as we um, read 
God's word together. We, do, we stand out of honor and reverence for the word of God. And I'm going to go ahead and pick up what Pastor Mike's been doing. I'm going to say, here's the word of God. And you're going to say, let's get after it together. So here is the word of God. Amen. Chapter 22, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham. Now, when you see the bold, that's your job to read that. So he... Okay, then start reading. Just kidding. (laughs) How about if I point to you when it's your turn? Okay. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham. He replied, Hanani. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded the donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to the... Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. He himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went up together, Isaac spoke up and he said to his father, Father, yes, my son, Abraham said, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went up together. When they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Hanani, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy and do not do anything to him. Now I know you fear God because you have not withheld your son, your only son. So Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called this place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, help us understand the faith of Abraham this morning, a faith that answers in obedience no matter what. I pray that we would be a church, an unstoppable people, that at your voice we would reply, Heneni, give us ears to hear you, give us eyes to see you, and the courage to say yes to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So as you are saying hello to your neighbors, just go ahead and bless them in the name of Jesus. Bless them. There's a lot of blessing going on. Today we're talking about the radical faith that we see in this Abraham and Isaac story. But before we get there, I want to acknowledge that this is a hard text. Both the fact that God is asking for Abraham to be sacrificed and the fact that Abraham is seeming to do this without any protest. This is disturbing. Two things to remember, though, while we approach this text. This is not Abraham's first encounter with God. God has revealed his nature to Abraham, as we've heard the stories over the summer. And Abraham understands the character, the faithfulness, the love of his God. The second thing I want us to note, that this is, a, this is the writing of Moses, and as he writes this, he says right from the start, this is a test. Abraham was being tested. And we see at the end that God does not allow the sacrifice at all. He's revealing his character, again, that he is not like the other gods that Abraham might have seen, who in that day would use child sacrifice. In this passage, what I see is faith. A faith that's been created by a relationship with God and demonstrated in obedience. And if we're going to talk about faith today, we have to think about Hebrews 11. Do you know what that chapter is? That's the chapter, Hebrews 11 is the chapter of faith. All the heroes of faith are listed in there. Hebrews 11.1 was the definition, the assurance of things hoped 
4, the conviction of things not yet seen. Hebrews 11.6 says this, Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So faith, we see, is an important part of our relationship. It's important to God. In a book that I use often with kids, it's called Children, Can You Hear Me? This is how that book defines it. He says, whenever you see me or hear me, that's called faith. Faith is seeing what I show your heart. Faith is hearing what I say to your heart. Faith is believing whatever I show you, even before it happens, because I always tell the truth. Faith helps you hear me and see me better and better. And I believe that the longer and the more we practice walking in faith, we will see God better and better. And we will know that he never fails us. He hasn't started failing us, and he's not going to start. He is faithful. So our main idea this morning is that we are going to walk in two-fisted faith. As we looked at Abraham, we see what his two fists are. Abraham heard God's voice, and he heeded God's direction. This is faith, believing and obeying. Abraham makes it two different times in that chapter of faith in Hebrews. The first time is when he's called to move out of the land, everything he's familiar with. Abraham's not tied to the law. So there's no moral compass that Abraham is having to follow to earn God's favor. So how does he make this list? Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God. That was credited him as righteousness. Being righteous is being made right with God. Abraham believed God. So that's how he made it into this chapter. 11.8 says, faith motivated Abraham to obey God's call and leave the familiar to discover the territory he was destined to inherit from God. So he left with only a promise. Without even knowing where he was going, Abraham heard God and he heeded his direction. He moved away from Ur into the land of Canaan. Later in the same chapter, Hebrew speaks of Abraham again, and this time it refers to the text that we read today. Hebrews eleven seventeen says, faith operated powerfully in Abraham when he was put to the test to offer up Isaac. For even though he received God's promises of descendant, he was willing to offer up his only son. For God had promised, through your son Isaac, your lineage will carry on your name. Abraham's faith made it logical to him that God would raise him from the dead. Our definition is the assurance of things hoped for. Abraham hoped his son would live and the conviction of things not yet seen. Abram hadn't seen God raise anyone or anything from the dead, but he had the faith to believe it could happen. So when we start in chapter 22, verse 1, it starts with, God tested Abraham. This was not a test to produce faith, but actually it's a test to reveal faith. God built in Abraham slowly, piece by piece, year by year, into the man of faith that he was at this moment. And for it to be a real test, it had to be something that Abraham would want to resist. This test was going to reveal what was inside of Abraham and what he believed and how well he knew God. About six years ago, my sister was diagnosed with breast cancer. And as she was praying, she just thought, God, make this trial, help this trial make me look more like you. And what he said to her, he said, no, Lisa, this trial is going to let you know me better. And when you know me, the fruit of that is that you'll look like me. We need to know God better. We've talked about Abe's journey and trials all summer long, and this is what has formed his faith for this day. This summer, we see that Abraham didn't always make the right choices. Are you with me? You guys have been here. You've heard some of the things but he always had that two-fisted faith. He heard God's voice, and he heeded God's direction. So God says, Abraham, and he replies, here I am. Abraham's quick reply of here I am is actually the Hebrew word heneni. How many of you guys know what heneni means? This is a powerful word. What it means, it says, whatever you are about to ask of me, I am already in agreement with it. My answer is yes. 
That's how we responded to God. Whatever it is that you're about to ask of me, I am already in agreement with it. My answer is yes. What a faith to be able to respond to God with Heneni. You hear your name, you reply Heneni, that means you're already going. My job description, Pastor Mike has tried to come up with one sentence job descriptions. So mine, I absolutely love. The minute he told me, I grabbed it. I said, yes. It says, to create a team that will help kids say yes to Jesus and no to lies. Can't you get behind that? Yes, helping kids say yes to Jesus and no to lies. That sounds like Heneni. Whatever it is you are about to ask of me, I am already in agreement with that. This one word, Abraham shows a spectacular trust and belief in God, earned by a lifelong journey with God. Verse 2 says, Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Abraham heard God's voice. What a horrific, unthinkable thing to hear. This is the direction. It kind of makes me asking you to serve in kids' ministry sound easy. This is a hard direction for us to hear, rightfully so, because we know the value of human life, and we know God values human life. Psalm talks about how he knit us in in our mother's womb. He knew us before we were born, that we are his handiwork, we're his artwork. God values life too. But in Abraham's life as a wanderer through Canaan, There were many Canaanite gods who demanded the sacrifice. So maybe as Abraham's learning what journeying with God would be like, maybe this is part of it. But actually, no. Abraham could not have expected this because of the promise in 2112 where it says, you're going to have descendants and it's going to come from Isaac. So the words that God had said, this doesn't seem to line up. But he's replied, Heneni, whatever it is you ask of me, my answer is yes. I'm already in agreement. There doesn't seem to be room to sacrifice Isaac here. But Abraham, he hears God's voice. And what does he do next? You guys remember what he does? He heeds his direction. Verse 3 says, early the next morning, it doesn't seem like there was any waiting. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey, took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he cut, an, when he cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham saw the mountain. Abraham, one of the richest men in the area, maybe the richest men in the area, so blessed by God, so many servants, he goes out to gather the wood. He sets up the donkey. I imagine this was his time as okay, God, I'm just going to do it. I got to think he's thinking in his head. But what's so interesting is in this text, we don't see any response from Abraham. That's unusual because all summer long, we've seen him be afraid, so he lies about Sarah being his wife. We see him be um, thinking he has a way that he could help God, you know, start that descendant line by doing fancy things with Hagar, has Ishmael. We see that when God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, that he had ideas. Uh, he tried to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Negotiate with God. We see that he got upset when Sarah said, it's time for Ishmael and Hagar to leave. Abraham, it says he was concerned, he was upset, but here there's no record of response. Just that he heeded his direction. His response was Heneni. He had already made his decision. Whatever you say of me, I am in agreement with it, and I will do it. This is that two-fisted faith that he walked in. So Abraham today, he's older. Abraham is wiser, and today he is full of faith. He's actively believing that the promiser is going to keep his promise. So three days, they arrive in Mount Moriah. They believe that from where Abraham and Isaac start for three days, it would put them about where Jerusalem was created in the mounts of Moriah. So some people think that where this actually took place was where they built the temple, where there'd be future sacrifices of the lamb. Some people think that this might have even been on the mount that Jesus climbed up to, to be crucified. 
He turns to his servants and he says, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, yes, my son? He said, the fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Abraham is older, he's wiser, and he's full of faith. We will go and we will come back. Did you catch that? The other statement of faith, the Lord God will provide the lamb. This shows that Abraham knew his promiser and that he was a promise keeper. So when they reached the place that God told them about, Abraham built an altar there and he arranged the wood on it and he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar. Now, there's discussion about how old Isaac is. A lot of the the stories you might see in a children's Bible show him as a little boy going up the mountain. But when they look at the text and how old Ishmael and Sarah are and how old Abraham, they're actually thinking he might be a teenager, late teenagers, maybe in his 20s. I've even heard as high as early 30s. So he's an older man. And you think about how Abraham, who's well past 100, how how would he have bound his son and put him on top of the altar. It seems to me that Isaac, the beloved, isn't fighting this. Then he reached out his hand. He took the knife to slay his son. The unthinkable is all set. The agony of what's about to happen is about to happen. And then the angel of the Lord yells out, Abraham, Abraham. And do you remember what's the one word that Abraham replies? Heneni, Heneni. Who likes to be interrupted? I even taught my kids what to do so they would not interrupt me. I had the no interrupt rule. They would have to come up and they'd put their hand, if they had something they wanted to say and I was in a conversation, they had to put their hand on my leg and I would cover it. That would signal to them, I know you're here. I know you have something you want to tell me, but I'm in in a conversation right now and I'll, I'll get to you. I had a no interrupt rule. But here, God interrupts. Aren't we glad he interrupted? We welcome his interruption. And I thought, do I always welcome his interruption? Do you you welcome his interruption? When everything is set, when I know what God wants me to do, like I'm talented, I'm going, I'm going to just get it done. And Abby was was talking to her about this text, my daughter Abby, and she said, it's kind of like when you pull your car out of your driveway. You don't just look once, make sure nothing's there, and then send it. She says, you look, but you continue to check in, make sure that your surroundings are safe. I think that is a good word. We need to remain interruptible by God. We need to stay tuned into his voice. And sometimes God just gives us what we need for that next step. So Verse 13, it says, Abraham looked up, and there he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over, he took the ram, and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, on that mountain, it says, on that mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Abraham's two-fisted faith statement of earlier that said, the Lord will provide, is becoming true. It's finally spoken. It's finally recorded. Jehovah Jireh is finally recorded in scripture. What a beautiful reveal of this new name of God for Abraham. Amen? And I love how this trial produced the new name of God for Abraham. But to be clear, God was, God is, and God will always be our provider. Him realizing it personally through his story just revealed that to him in a deeper way. That didn't create that part of God. That just revealed that part of God. And I just love that we can experience God ourselves. Have you experienced him as healer? Have you experienced him as forgiver? Have you experienced him as lover of your souls? There's always more for us to learn about God and his character. And the reality is we get to experience it ourselves. We get to read about the way he, he reveals himself through scripture. And we get to hear it by the way he reveals himself through stories. God chooses us. 
We are chosen by him. So as we step back into Genesis 22, kind of maybe from a little further back, we see foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. The chapter becomes so much more for us, those of us who live after the crucifixion. Because as we look at this, we see a foreshadowing of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice on the cross. Listen to this. Both Isaac and Jesus were the long-awaited beloved sons who were born out of miraculous circumstances. Both carried the wood that is to be the instrument of their death on their back up the hill. Both stories have loving fathers that are willingly um, giving their sons up, and the sons are following obediently towards their death. In each of these stories, God provides the sacrificial substitute. Genesis 22, he provides a ram, which is the male lamb. In John 1, 29, Jesus is identified as the lamb of God. So here we see a picture of God restoring himself through Jesus Christ, to the world. We know that this Bible is not full of a bunch of little stories. We know this Bible is one story of God's redemption plan to bring the whole world back into himself. Praise the Lord, right? Amen. So how do we build this double-fisted faith that pleases God? Our first step is to ask, where is our our faith focused on? Where do you put your trust? Where do you put your hope? I heard it said that if you don't see situations glistening with hope, you're not seeing them the way God is seeing them. It's crazy how easy it is for us to put our weak counterfeits, um, to put our faith in those weak counterfeits, like our good character or our name, our popularity. Maybe we put our faith in our career or our financial security, maybe in our natural talents and abilities. You know, there's a lot of talented people here at Sage Hills Church, and you could do a lot of things for God. But all of that will fail in comparison to putting your faith in the author and perfecter of our faith. That is where our faith belongs. And it's not the strength of your faith that even matters in this equation. It's the strength of the object of where you place your faith. The strength of the object of where you place your faith. That is what makes the difference. Strong faith in your counterfeit will never be better than your weak faith in Jesus. Amen? Jesus tells us that the faith as small as a mustard seed will move mountains when it's placed in the creator of mountains. The two-fisted faith that pleased God is placed in him alone. He is the one true God, and he will never let you down. He is worthy of your faith. He is faithful to you. This is what Abraham learned as he followed God. And this is why Abraham was able to answer God's call with Heneni. Whatever it is you ask of me, I am already in agreement with it. My answer is yes. But agree with me this morning, we don't want to settle for weak faith. We don't, right? We don't. So how do we get to the point of Heneni? It's, it's kind of one thing. Build your faith by knowing God. Know him. It begins simply by knowing him, knowing his great love for you, knowing that you were chosen before the creation of the world to be part of him, that he loves you. The Bible, eight, Romans 8, 31 says, I am for you, I'm not against you. Spending time with him in your reading and your prayer, worshiping, sometimes worshiping is bowing down and just laying it all out and saying, I got nothing for you today. God, just be here with me. Sometimes your worship is standing and declaring his goodness, remembering how thankful you are. No matter what, where you're bowed down or you're standing up, we, we come to God thankful that he's always there to hear us. Reading his word is one of the easiest ways to know him, and we have the gift to hold it and read it. Praying is talking to God, simply talking and listening. And this is what I love, is that he didn't create us to be in a system where if we say yes to him, then we get to be a part of his household as servants. He's created that when we say yes to him, he welcomes us into his home as children, beloved children. And that close relationship, we build any relationship with one word, T-I-M-E, time. That's what it takes to know God. Another way we can know God is talking to others around us who know God. That's called fellowship. Paying attention to what God is doing in you and around you. 
paying attention to what God's doing in the people around you. When we talk, our faith is built. Telling your stories of God and how he's at work in your life is so generous. I want us to be a generous people of telling his good stories. That builds our faith. The Bible in Revelation says, we will overcome by the blood of the lamb, that's Jesus, Jesus took care of that, and the word of our testimony. When we hear the stories of his goodness, his faithfulness, his provision, his forgiveness, we think, well, God, if you do that for them, you can do that for me. So I'll invite the worship team to come out here. I had said earlier that my sister said, the fruit of knowing God will help you look more like Jesus. There's another fruit of knowing God. It informs you who you are. When you know God as Father, you realize your position as a son and a daughter, a beloved son and daughter. When you know him as Emmanuel, you realize that you are never alone. Some of us feel alone sometimes. Beloved, let me remind you, Emmanuel, you are never alone. God with us. When you know God is your shepherd, you lack nothing, and you know that he will lead you, he will protect you, he will comfort you. Abraham answered Hanani because of his length of days. His length of days with God and his experience of God's faithfulness to him. And this test added one more name to Abraham's list, Jehovah Jireh. Ask God to open your eyes to see him. Ask God to open your ears to hear him. Abraham walked in two-fisted faith. He heard God's voice and he heeded God's direction. This is really cool when I was writing this out and I just saw something here. It says, knowing God will help you hear his voice. Heeding God's direction will help you know him better, which will help you hear his voice, and then heeding his direction will help you know God better, which will help you hear his voice. Because when you say, Hineni, whatever it is, I'm already in agreement with, my answer is yes. There will be times where you won't feel strong enough. You won't feel smart enough. You won't feel old enough or young enough. You won't feel you have the courage. And that's where God comes in. He's like, well, you don't need it. Because remember, I am your God. I am provider. I am with you. I am for you. I am your strength and your weakness. Put your faith in God, and he will reveal you more of who he is. So are you ready to know him better? then it's time to say Hanani. Will you say Hanani with me? Hanani. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you that you are a God that is with us always, that you give us exactly what we need, and we can trust you. You are so good that when you speak to us, when you call our name, we can answer Hanani and know that you're with us, that you got us. So Lord, be with us today. Reveal yourself to us today and help us know you better. In Jesus' name we pray.